Okay, we are officially live. Um, I want to uh, welcome um, everyone to today's Medical Advisory Board Educational Series event as we look at developmental neuropsychology. Definitely a topic that is um, frequent with lots of questions in our community, and we are really excited to welcome Dr. Seth Warchowski um, from the University of Michigan, who serves on our medical advisory board to this series. Um, so welcome. <laughs> We're Thank excited you. to speak to you today about this important topic that, um, you know, HIE can affect children in so many different ways. And we have, you know, kiddos that are um, across all spectrum of outcomes. And, um, you know, understanding neuropsychology has been one that um, that is, I would say in the past maybe three or four years has become more of a, an understood topic and focus uh, for our community and for, you know, people getting referrals when their children are either diagnosed with a learning or attention issue or, you know, again, have these uh, multiple complexities of, um, you know, either cerebral palsy, epilepsy, things like that, that can also affect um, affect how kids learn and how kids, um, you know, develop. So thank you so much for joining us today. And if you want to give a little bit of background about you and your practice and your expertise, and we'll get right into it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Betsy. It's a pleasure to um, talk with uh, everyone today about this um, topic, and I hope there will be uh, a lot of questions. I will give a, a little bit of an um, introduction using slides but I think most of what we want to do is be able to go back and forth with uh, addressing some of the things that are coming up for people with their children as they're getting into school age, uh, especially. Um, my background is I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist. I've been at the University of Michigan just about forever, um, <laughs> since 1988. And um, I have gradually moved more and more into the research world. I particularly am focused on work with uh, children with cerebral palsy and do a lot in that area. In recent years, I've also gotten involved with uh, research on early identification. So there's more and more going on with early identification of needs, um, not just with autism, but with different kinds of um, conditions like cerebral palsy uh, as well. So, uh, I know this is a very difficult time for families and particularly when a child has additional needs and hopefully what we'll do is we'll go through and try to get some clarity on uh, ways of thinking about some of these issues with um, planning for education, even uh, behavioral kinds of uh, issues that come up. Um, I'll first just talk about what neuropsychology is for a moment, and uh, then we'll go into just, just touch on a number of areas that we keep an eye on um, related to HIE, preterm birth, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we'll just go all the way into um, questions. So, let's see if this works. I, have to, I always have to give a disclosure. <laughs> I don't get paid for this talk today, um, and I don't have any conflicts that I'm aware of. Um, and we are so grateful for you donating your time and expertise to us. <laughs> and oh, it's a pleasure. I think it's super important, and um, I, I also think it's really helpful for families to have a forum where they gather and share information, and this is just really perfect for that. Great. Uh, so let me talk a little about what a um, uh, neuropsychologist does, and we're often brought in to identify um, cognitive capabilities and needs. And when parents, especially when children have really significant uh, kinds of impairments, when parents are asked, well, what do you want to know from these assessments? The answer is usually pretty general, like, what is my child capable of learning? And uh, how do we move along from there? With less um, severe impairments, there are more specific kinds of questions that come up, and we'll probably be talking about a lot of those today as well. But neuropsychological assessments are used for diagnostics. They, um, in the old days, they were used before we had neuroimaging to even spot the lesion, you know, where are the problems with uh, brain function. 
Uh, at this point, we're really being brought in to identify the functional kinds of difficulties because imaging is pretty good. I will say that it's not unusual to have MRIs that are negative. There's nothing found, and yet the child is showing some specific cognitive needs. So uh, sort of the big picture is that we look at uh, level of intelligence, and people think of IQ as being one number but there's a lot more to it, and we'll talk about that briefly in a moment. Um, we also look at specific areas. What are the child's strengths that can be exploited for um, learning? How do they learn best? Uh, what are the impairments? And what is needed to address the areas of difficulty and utilize the areas of strength? So we're specifically looking at attention, executive functions and visual spatial skills, learning and memory, other areas. We use those findings then to um, help with clinical planning, as well as educational kinds of planning and advocacy, and we'll talk about that, and vocational uh, planning and transition uh, kinds of planning as well. So we see um, children with a lot of different conditions in a pediatric neuropsychology clinic. Um, we see uh, many children who've had all different uh, severities of traumatic brain injury. We see a lot of children with cerebral palsy. And then a lot of children where the problems are coming up at school age and there's no real condition identified except that they were born preterm. Uh, and so those are more subtle uh, kinds of difficulties, but they become less than subtle as the demands increase during the school years. And then you can see all these other areas too, where children are coming in with these types of needs as well. So in a neuropsychological assessment, uh, there are different approaches. Some are very uh, fixed batteries of tests and some are sort of menu driven depending on the child's needs. What's the difference between a neuropsychological assessment and a psychoeducational assessment? Well, in the school-based testing, typically they're going to look at IQ, at intelligence, and they're also going to look at uh, academic achievement, of course. And, and those are the big areas that go into a psychoeducational assessment. They may take on some areas having to do with behavior. Most schools will not diagnose ADHD, but they will suggest that the findings are, uh, are in that direction. In the neuropsychological assessment, again, we are gonna go through a whole set of domains. So the psychoeducational portion is embedded in the neuropsychological testing. If the child's already had a psychoeducational testing recently, we won't do it again, unless there's some question about those findings. We'll instead focus on these other areas, attention, processing speed. Children can be uh, much smarter than they are fast. And that's a huge issue for a lot of the children that have sustained early kinds of brain insult. Uh, executive functions, we start to look at when the child is around third grade or so, that's when we really go into that area because you're no longer spoon fed, you know, the way you were in the first and second grade, it's really you have to do projects and plan out and all of that. Different aspects of learning and memory, language functions, uh, these areas that we call the nonverbal areas, and those are huge for children who've had an early uh, kind of a brain lesion and then academic skills, motor skills. And we do look at uh, psychological status. So there is psychology in neuropsychology, right? <clears throat> and the, the types of um, assessments that are done are gonna vary. So um, from up to about age three, we're doing a developmental assessment and it won't look the same as what we do later on. It might be a Bailey or there are some other types of tests that are done. It's really as you get older that we start to separate out all these different functions. Um, up until uh, through kindergarten, really, it's a short assessment. It's good. You're going to come in and it's a few hours. Um, and then uh, beginning at first grade and going on up, it, it tends to be longer. And it could go for uh, basically the same length as a school day. <clears throat> 
we do become uh, a bit of a liaison between the clinic and the uh, school. So as you know, a lot of what goes on for children in terms of support, treatment, intervention is occurring in the school setting. Uh, and we get that under either special education or uh, the 504 plans, which are through the Americans with Disability Act or related to it. Um, so our, our data from these assessments can be used to help determine if the child has certain types of needs. If the school wants to, they can reject the report. They are not forced to take the um, neuropsychological findings. Um, but it's very rare that they would fuss about it. It usually is saving them time and effort, that sort of thing, because we do what they would do plus. Uh, and it works the other way as well. Sometimes we'll do an assessment and we'll say, we'd really like the school to go back in and pick apart the math more than we did. So, uh, so it, we aim for a collaboration with the school. And uh, when things are complex, then we want to have a collaborative phone call after the assessment with the family and the school on the line to talk over the findings. Does the child have impairments even if they don't meet criteria? Yes. So we do see that where the school says, well, they're not actually fitting in the box. And then as uh, all of you know, it becomes a matter of attitude from the school, what we're going to get. So we can argue that, you know, this child really can use these types of accommodations or this type of support. And mostly schools will find a way to do that, whether it's under a 504 or some other way. The exception is uh, some charter schools and private schools. Then, we, then it becomes a very different issue that we can talk about later. Um, so we're identifying accommodations, some services, speech language, we might talk about that type of thing, and modifications, which are different, where you need a different type of a uh, curriculum, which doesn't come up as often, but it can. So uh, I just went through a lot of this, but essentially what this is showing is that at the very young ages is when we're identifying things that are more motoric or communicative, that type of thing, as well as uh, autism. Cerebral palsy, we're now able to identify at very young ages. I mean, mm -hmm. four months, you know, three months. Um, and then up into preschool where uh, various behavior kinds of difficulties become clearer and the beginnings of some question about cognitive delays. And then it's in school age that we get into all the areas that uh, we just talked about with specific kinds of cognitive concerns. I just wanted to comment that uh, there are sex differences in uh, vulnerability to uh, neonatal encephalopathy, and maybe this has been talked about before in your talk. So uh, males, um, as usual, are more vulnerable to this and that. They're more vulnerable to, um, to hemorrhage and specific white matter injury. Um, their repair processes when they are injured are not as good as females. But females have sort, sort of an immaturity in their cerebral blood flow regulation. And so, th so this is one of the only areas where females seem to be a little more immature than males. And once you know it, that happens to be an advantage because uh, they therefore are at lower risk for certain types of um, bleeds that occur. So, you know, we can't win. <laughs> uh, and just a few condition specific comments and then we, we can just launch into it. So um, with IQ, I just would urge people to be really careful about that. A lot of children who've had an early kind of encephalopathy, if you look at their overall IQ, it might look kind of low, but then when you look carefully, their verbal reasoning might be pretty darn good. It's their, um, what we used to call perceptual reasoning that tends to be a little lower. And then those areas on the IQ test, they have nothing to do with reasoning, like mm -hmm. working memory and processing speed, and that can pull down the whole IQ. So be careful how you interpret an IQ. Um, with gestational age, the, the more preterm the child, 
the more risk for a lower uh, IQ. And there's a huge kind of a set of findings and literature about what children need when they're born preterm. That's been in an area that's much more well studied than HIE per se. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is an older study. It's held up pretty well, just showing again what I said, which is when they're, a child has very low birth weight, they're very they're preterm. Uh, the language skills, you don't see a star. They, they are not as at risk in the area of language as they are in these other areas, learning and memory, perceptual, motor skills, executive functions. That's where that you really see the greater risk. Finally, um, as you're, you're probably aware, there is a grading of uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. This is a modification, but you'll find a detailed um, chart on the HIE, the Hope for HIE website. Uh, but this is the same type of thing showing that how the baby was doing then results in the uh, grading of what kind of risks are, are um, entailed. And it's based on how alert the baby was and their muscle tone, whether or not they had seizures, their breathing, how long it lasted, these types of things. So essentially, uh, here you have moderate and severe encephalopathy. And the more to the left um, that those lines are, the greater the risk. So GCA is uh, general cognitive ability. And essentially what you're seeing is that it's really when you get into severe encephalopathy that you see the greatest degree of uh, risk. And that makes sense, of course. Um, well, I just want to stop you real quick there. Sorry, that got really loud real quick too. <laughs> That's okay. But, and that is one of the things I just wanted to point out that, um, that the research has significantly been lacking in studying mild kiddos. Yes. And so that is one of the things that moving forward, there's a lot of different, um, you know, researchers right now that are actually engaging and wanting to look at these long-term outcomes of mildly affected children from the Sarnat scale staging versus, you know, just a clinical outcome and things like that. So we're really, really eager to see what that looks like. Like, um, you know, as that research com continues to come out. Yeah, and you're bringing up also a really important point, which is a lot of research was based on IQ. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was, well, if the child ends up with a uh, reasonable IQ, then there are, no, there are no problems. That's that. That's a good outcome. But there, this is where you get into things with moderate encephalopathy, mild encephalopathy, where the IQs tend to be good, but that's not really telling you whether there are specific impairments in these areas that we just talked about and academic risk. So um, yeah, that's a good point. And here you see the academic risk um, where certainly with severe encephalopathy, the um, uh, risks are quite high in the areas of math and written language as well. So like you say, we don't really have a lot uh, for mild, moderate, and these are small samples. Look at those sample sizes, you know, 26, 15. I mean, that's that makes it hard to uh, generalize and make, make big statements. And that's it by way of um, PowerPoint. So, um, yeah, we can talk about what's on people's minds at this point. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. If you want to... Stop sharing your screen so then we can go. There we go. Then we'll go back to the you and I back and forth. Um, yeah, thank you so much that all of that information is so important for our families, um, especially as, you know, people are looking at, um, you know, how they're moving through in their journeys and, and what, you know, clinicians are saying to them as they're, you know, uh, beginning, you know, either in early, you know, infancy, toddlerhood, things like that. Um, you know, and I, I'd really like you to speak a little bit about because we see this big disconnect um, in particular with HIE where a lot of times the, and it's shifting thankfully, but the emphasis has been so much on early motor milestones instead of looking at the whole child's development. And so I know that you've done a lot of work in particular um, 
which you mentioned earlier in your in your talk about this per, this specific thing of looking at assessments and things like that where we'll have a lot of kids that will you know get like a Bailey assessment at two or three and they check off the box and they say have a great life we'll see you later and then you know we see as a forum and as a support community families coming back and saying hey we were told that things were going fine and we shouldn't, you know, shouldn't worry. And, um, you know, but now my child is, you know, entering school and we're seeing some differences, you know, what, you know, I guess in your, um, work, um, is, is that, I guess, are you seeing the shift as well from like a clinical standpoint, um, with, you know, educating families a little bit more? Yes. Yeah, I think um, you really captured it. So one of the things I mentioned earlier that I'm involved with um, research where we're looking at early uh, identification. And what we're doing is we are um, having parents do ratings of their child's development, comprehensive ratings, about eight times between birth and uh, 18 months of age. Mm -hmm. And then if there's an issue in any of these areas, and I mean any, any areas, communication, sleep, any of this, we let them know and, mm -hmm. and have them talk with their pediatrician. Now people are starting to finish up the study and, the, and uh, we're asking, how did it go? And what was your reaction? And they say, one of the things that was most helpful about this study is it gave me ammo. I was able to go to my pediatrician and say, wait, you know, and in these uh, first months, they're spotting these areas of concern. And so that's helping to get people in for assessment. But the Baileys, like you say, so they go in and get that developmental assessment in the first few years. And clinicians caught on a while ago, hopefully, that um, the Bailey was you can't make a uh, statement about what's coming based on the Bailey. And furthermore, it was not picking up on certain things like language delays, that type of thing as well. So typically, um, if it's a condition where there are significant risks like we just looked at, mm -hmm. then we would say uh, right now, this is where we are, but we'll wanna see the child again um, you know, before entering school. And then there are these milestones where if things look um, like if there are any issues with early learning, we're still going to want to see them again as they get toward age eight mm -hmm. uh, because there, there are other things that could come up with how they keep track of things and all of that, attention and executive function. And I just wanted to say also, probably a lot of people are thinking about ADHD. Mm -hmm. So with cerebral palsy, the risk for ADHD looks like it might be something like four times higher than the general population. It's pretty big. And, uh, and I would say with these early brain insults, we know the risk is increased, but we don't know as much about areas outside of cerebral palsy in that mm -hmm. way. So, uh, I'm not sure that fully answered your question, but that, I think it's right. very, very helpful. I mean, in particular, we know roughly 40% of our children will get diagnosed with cerebral palsy, but that leaves 60% of our community of, you know, it's kind of this 50, almost 50, 50, really, of what about the, the rest of this community? Like if you don't have cerebral palsy, you know, in, in the past, you know, again, it was kind of glossed over of, of these potential challenges. And now we're, I'm just so grateful that we're seeing a lot of this, um, you know, this data come out and to kind of, to back up really what we see as a community of, of our families. And, and that way, like you, like to your point of doing this early identification, um, as we know with any sort of early intervention, you know, it helps outcomes down the road. Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about these accommodations, um, you know, in school and in life um, and how important it is. I mean, just like many other things with different therapies and, and, and accommodations, mobility aids, um, there's so many different ways that can help children, um, you know, that might have some of these deficits, uh, you know, 
really live a, a very good life that, you know, with a lot of potential for, for being productive members of society and things like that, you know, across the gamut. Absolutely. So one of the areas that we do have a pretty big effect on is the use of um, assistive technologies. And, uh, and of course, that's just constantly improving. Schools don't always have fabulous resources in that regard. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we used to have um, these regional assistive technology labs for sets of ISDs. And uh, at least in Michigan, uh, those are not available the way they used to be. Um, so part of what we do as neuropsychologists is to be trying to keep up with that. And then there are rehabilitation engineering groups and speech language pathologists who are doing a good job with identifying those needs as well. Uh, a lot of what works best though is if it's an ongoing assistive technology consultation, preferably in the school, and that the technologies are targeting things in a way that's collaborative with the child as well as they're getting older. So, you know, we all have different things that we want to use for technologies. Um, and there are children who, you know, don't like voice recognition, that sort of thing. So, so it's really good to make it an ongoing uh, collaboration. I always recommend that as a child learns to use technologies and strategies, the school gives them an opportunity to teach it, teach it to others. Mm -hmm. because um, we spend too much time focused on what the child needs and not enough time on giving them opportunity to give, if that makes any sense. You know. Yeah, I, I love that. That makes so much sense. We do have a couple questions that have come in. So if we'll do a little addressing of those and then, um, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. So one of the questions, any suggestions on how to help kids test better? My son is easily frustrated and has difficulty pushing through all kinds of assessments. Our neuropsych commented that it was obvious that my son knew way more than he showed. Yeah, I mean, that's that would be an ongoing uh, conversation with the family because children have different reasons why they're having difficulty with testing. Of course, you can get things like alternative locations and uh, you can break tests into smaller uh, components that, that, you know, so where you, you have briefer sessions, that sort of thing. You set up a reinforcement system so that as they complete a portion of testing, uh, you know, that, um, that they have some kind of reinforcement for that. Um, but there are other things to look at too, whether there's anxiety, the material is being presented way above their level, that would be a huge problem. And this notion of um, processing speed, they're mm -hmm. just not given enough time. So, yeah, that's, I mean, processing speed, I know personally for my own child is, you know, is slower, but yet, you know, he's given information and hours later he can regurgitate it. But if you ask him to recall immediately, he, you know, that's where the anxiety comes from. Yes, it's, yes. it's fascinating to see how his brain works. <laughs> yeah. And I know he's not alone with that. There's many kids like ours. Yeah. So. All right. The next question. Um, and you know, this is one that comes up in our community. A lot of our kids have um, a secondary microcephaly. So, you know, like a slower, obviously they've had a brain insult. So their brains, they just don't have the matter to grow. Um, and the question is, does it tell anything about the outcome or severity of like, you know, what their um, cognitive, you know, potential might be? Having microcephaly specifically? Mm-hmm. And like the secondary, because we know that primary microcephaly, that's like Zika related or a congenital or, you know, genetic component is a whole different subset than, um, than how it affects our community. Yeah. So I, uh, yes, yes and no. Um, again, you talk in terms of uh, risk that there is greater risk for lower um, functioning, mm -hmm. but I hope it's understood that there are a lot of things that modify risk. So if I say, well, you know, on average, children tend to score a standard deviation below peers. They score in the low average range or something like that. 
Well, you know, that doesn't tell you um, what's going to happen specifically in areas of reading for that child uh, or what they'll do in math. I want to talk about math for a second because it comes up constantly with um, predicting things. There are plenty of children who will specifically have trouble with their math facts and calculation. It's just going to be rough going. And, uh, and they might have specific difficulty even with geometry. But verbally, they're pretty good. And we have seen children go into areas that are more logical and step by step, like algebra, where if they're using a calculator, they do surprisingly well in uh, being able to do that type of math. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's all different kinds of math, and there are all different reasons why people will and will not have difficulty with them. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, this next question is right along with, I know, a lot of your research. Um, any advice for a neuropsych assessment for a deafblind child and how to facilitate delayed response during a timed assessment? Well, first of all, um, uh, let me answer the second part first. Um, there are a lot of children where it is not wise to do timed assessments, period. I mean, what is that going to tell you, right? So if you already know that it takes a child longer to do something, then why you give a test of another function like, uh, you know, math, where really what they're being tested on is how many problems they could do in a minute or whatever. That mm -hmm. just doesn't make any sense. So that's part of the approach. Um, but we do have ways of doing testing uh, where there's, we take advantage of whatever the um, uh, intact function is. So the child can hear, um, but they can't uh, speak. So wait, you said, to give me the two again, so uh, deaf blind, yeah. So deaf, it's deaf blind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So then we we would have to go with um what like tactile or, right. or something of that sort. Yeah. And and there are some ways of looking at um, learning, for example, motor learning and tactile uh, learning, um that that can be used in a neuropsychological assessment. We do have at the University of Michigan we have an adapted cognitive assessment lab. And that's exactly what we do. So the first part of testing would not be to launch into these tests I just talked about. Mm -hmm. It would be to identify what are the best ways of responding. Um, the other thing is uh, that we do have ways of doing testing where you don't have to respond at all overtly. There's no overt response. And that really goes into things like brain computer interface labs. These are not widely used, um, but there are specialty areas that we'll, we'll be able to use that as well. Great. All right. And we're going to wrap up one final question. I think this is a great one is how, so the question is, um, at what point and how do um, families, you know, bring in or get referred to a neuropsych? Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to start out in the negative and say, whatever else happens with the referral, do not have the physician write for school problems or academic difficulties. Insurance companies just do not want to send people in for that. They mm -hmm. think of that as a school issue. So have them identify the uh, neonatal encephalopathy or whatever as the primary diagnosis for coming in. Um, and then the referral itself, it's generated typically by your primary care physician, which is fine. And, uh, and they would then send to pediatric neuropsychology. But if you make sure it has the medical uh, diagnosis, you stand a much better chance of getting in in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Great. If there's seizure disorder, make sure they list it. It gets you in even faster. These are amazing tips. <laughs> They're always helpful because we, you know, we're always looking to how we can work through to expedite things for our families and, and walk through the maze. So um, I want to thank everyone today for attending. Um, we'll keep, you know, comments going and um, Dr. Wojciechowski serves on our medical advisory board. So we can always take these questions back and uh, we'll continue to provide resources. We know this is a huge topic for our, our community. We want to 
uh, thank you so much today for your time, um, your you know commitment to helping our families and our organization and and really educating our community on the best ways uh, to get access to resources and understand how to best help their, their children. Thank you so pleasure. much for your time My today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. This will be available afterwards, so feel free to reference back. Don't worry. It's not going away. <laughs> All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.